for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Friday morning, June 24, 1977. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp and Conference Grounds, Summer Camp Meeting, being held at Hot Springs, Arkansas. This tape is with Brother Wynn Worley of South Chicago, uh, Illinois, the Hedgewitch Baptist Church, speaking on the book of Jude, Sin in the Camp. Should this for any reason be defective, please explain and return for replacement. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another first. John 4, 7 and 8. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise Jesus. Second Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and 5. We warmed up on this one a little earlier. Hallelujah. We're going to get some more meat out of this one. Second Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and 5. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And I believe there's a companion scripture to this one over in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So uh, we'll turn to that one uh, after we sing this one. Put them both together but in the mouth of Two or three witnesses, let God's word be established. Hallelujah. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah, they are mighty. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah, they are mighty, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Hallelujah. And over in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. This, if you then be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above. Hallelujah. And the scripture says, ye are dead. One of my brothers back in the church of fellowship uh, in Hegwish in Chicago he said uh, that when he uh, has problems that he remembers this scripture and he sees himself, he just steps away and sees himself as a corpse on the floor. And he says, somebody come over him with a chicken dinner or uh, dumped a million dollars on the chest of that corpse or, or uh, anything that, of the world that, that intrigues us or fascinates us or draws us away, that, that he just pictures himself there and says his, his actions standing there or his reaction to that thing or that situation should be the same as that corpse. That's what this scripture is saying. Hallelujah. In Christ, he gives us the strength to overcome. Hallelujah. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead, ye are dead, ye are 
our dead and life is hid with Christ in God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Thank you. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead, ye are dead. Are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Are they worthy? Come on, now I call him a general in the army of the Lord. There are many other generals here. You don't know it, maybe, but you are. And there are a lot of lieutenants, and there are a lot of captains, and there are a lot of, lot of, lot of infantry, and there's a lot of different things. But this morning, he's going to come over here, and I don't know what he's going to say, and I don't think he knows what he's going to say, but I know the Holy Spirit knows what he's going to say and what he wants him to say, and I know the Father has told the Holy Spirit what to say. And I thank you. I bless you. This is his book. We're not selling books and making a big thing of it, but his book is back there, and you need to read it. Every Christian needs to read it. It'll help you say devil a little easier. It'll help you say enemy a little easier. It'll show you something, and you'll learn. Don't turn everything off. and Don't say, oh, well, the Lord's going to feed me. He'll give us manna. Well, he, he will, but you have to be in that realm to receive it. If you have your Bibles, would you open them, please, to the book of Jude? The book of Jude has been called the gospel to the apostates. The parallel book in the New Testament. And most books in the Bible have a parallel book in the Old and New Testament. The parallel book in the New Testament to the book of Jude is Second Peter. It strips the covers off of how the devil works. And a lot of people say, don't talk about the devil, it gives them power. That is rankest form of ignorance that I know of. God's people do not perish because they know about the devil. They're perishing and are in bondage because they do not know about him. And they're being taken in and suckered in on every hand by preachers and by others who come as angels of light who themselves are deceived and are in bondage. We have homosexuals in the pulpit. We have uh, adulterers running around the country beating their Bibles. And, if some, you know, if you yell something, a lot of people will believe it. If I say this, that means it's God, doesn't it? Lord, have mercy. Since when did God need Anything like that. He needs His Word. His people perish because of ignorance of God's Word. Talking about the devil never did strengthen him one iota. It rips the covers off of him. He hates it with a passion. That's why people run around and don't want you to mention it. Now, they don't know that, but that's why they don't, friend. Because if you don't expose the devil for what he is and who he is and within whom he's working, then you are untrue to the call of God. And everybody who says they're called of God is not called of God at all. At least they're not called of the God of heaven. Everybody who says, God told me which God is that they're talking about, if it doesn't measure up to the Word of God, it's a lie and the truth's not in it. God's work is suffering more from His friends, so-called, than it is from the enemy. The enemy from without can be defeated easily. It's the enemy that burrows within that is so dangerous. That's why the prophets of old, that's why... Uh, the New Testament prophets talk much about the enemy. And I call them the glory boys, the one that won't do nothing but shout and praise the Lord, and I have no objection to that. But you better have something to shout about. You better be sure you're not shouting about the wrong thing. You may be cheering the devil on. Did you know that? You better find out what the Bible says and not what men think it says. You get you a good English dictionary. It'll open a lot of passages of Scripture to you. You get three or four different translations and you'll be surprised that some of your pet theology will collapse. And if you get a Greek English dictionary, you'll find out that a lot of the theology is based on foolishness and men's fantasizing has nothing to do with the Word of God whatsoever. 
And my heart boils within me when I see the Word of God violated and trampled on every hand. And, and things passed off as truth which wouldn't hold water. There, there's a bucket full of holes in them. That's all they've got. Empty wagons rattle. You're welcome. Look at the book of Jude. Jude, the servant or slave of Jesus Christ. Now, Jude was a half-brother of Jesus Christ. They had the same daddy and the diff- uh, they had the same mother, different father. Jesus, of course, had the Father, the Holy Spirit. Jude was one of his brothers in the flesh. And yet, when he comes, he does not rear up and claim, I am the half-brother of Jesus. He said, Jude, a slave. This word servant is too weak. The Greek says slave, bond slave. When they translated it in 1611, Slave was an obnoxious term, and so they softened it somewhat. They said, that's too hard. Let's put it servant. Everywhere it's servant, put it slave, and you'll have it right on the button where the, what the Greek says. Now, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, he did not exalt his position. He was like Jesus, who didn't count it robbery to make himself equal with God. He didn't count it a thing to be grasped after. You be careful, and you're seeking to walk to God, with God that you don't get so full of pride you look like you've got pride sticking out of you like belly goat horns all over. Because believe you me, when the Word of God comes through, it does not exalt you, it humbles you. Every time you're used of God to pray, to deliver, to preach, to sing, to do anything, to exercise any gift, if it doesn't humble you down to the floor, there's something counterfeit working in you, friend. And I don't care who says it isn't. God does not minister to our pride. He will not give His glory nor share it with another. And it's high time that somebody sounded a trumpet in Zion and said, watch out for the wildfire. I'd rather have God's fire than than wildfire. Wildfire has done more damage to the kingdom of God and to the working of the people of God than anything else. It's turned people off right and left because even the world has sense enough to see the idiocy of some who call themselves servants of God. The devil has so deceived and so moved in in deception and spirits of deception have grabbed hold of people and have filled the pulpits with nothing but uh, so-called Holy Ghost nonsense. Now, if you think the world's not smarter than that, you've got another thing coming. And I'll guarantee you another thing, just as soon as you have false teaching come across, you'll have prophecies and messages in tongues through demonic forces that will jump on people and they'll verify and back up every lie that's been told. You better get back to the Word of God. I'd better get in the Word of God. I'd better know what God says. I'd better quit listening to voices because, listen, the air's full of voices, didn't you know? When God tells you something, you better know that it's backed up by Scripture. You better know that you're not violating scriptural principles. The devil scared the living hound out of most people saying, Judge not, lest you be judged. Judge not, lest you be judged. Let me tell you something. Sister, your foot's not a yard long. You say, you're judging my foot. No, I'm not. I have a mental picture of a yardstick. I know how long it is. Her foot is so much shorter than three foot that I don't have to get the yardstick to know for sure. Now, she had a foot two and a half yard, feet long. I might have to go get the stick and lay it down to be sure. I'd say, I don't think it's there. Friend, this is the yardstick. Anything that won't fit this thing is out. I mean, it's not partly right. It's all wrong. And everything is not spelled out item for item in the Word of God. But I'll guarantee you there are principles laid down and you do not violate those principles. When you violate a principle of God, I, I wouldn't give you a dime a cow pin for, for preachers who have no ethics. Did you know that sometimes preachers are the rudest, most discourteous people on earth? And they parade around, I'm super preacher number one. Baloney. That means they're not in the cow. If they were really that, they'd be saying, oh my God. How could you use me? And they wouldn't be saying with their lips. They'd mean it from their heart. Listen, the people who are used the most are the rottenest and the weakest, didn't you know? Whatever gave you any idea, just what a great prophecy came through me. Baloney! All that means is that you're less than the low. You say, you've got Scripture for that preacher? Haven't you read Paul's letter to the Corinthians? God uses the weak things, the despised things, the things that are not, to rip down the strongholds of the things that are. 
He uses the weak things because the weak things do not know. They know. They don't have anything. How could God ever use me because I don't have anything? I'm not anything. I'm stupid. I'm dumb. And they stand back in awe as God pours out His power. And they say, oh, praise God. Praise God. How could He do such wonder works in His glorious name? They don't strut around, you know, look at me. I am so great. How great I am is their theme song. Thank you. I'd hate to be like the preacher you heard about, didn't you? The young preacher. He came out of the cemetery, seminary one day. And he, he had uh, been all inspired. He had had a lecture that week on preparing sermons that you ought to memorize your sermons. So he thought, boy, that's it. I'm going to... So he worked and he worked and he memorized and he memorized. He got up, opened his Bible. He knew what his theme was, his, his text was, Behold, I come quickly. So he thought, well... I'll start again, then I'll get it going, you know. <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. Nothing. He thought, well, I'm bound to get it started on the third time around. So he backed off again. Behold, I come quickly. By this time, he's so nervous, he fell over the pulpit. <laughs> and he dumped right in the la lap of a dear little old lady. You know the kind out in the little country church, all sit on the front pew, amen? <laughs> and oh, he was so embarrassed, he got up and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. He said, that's all right, young man. You warned me three times. <laughs> well, I'd hate to be like that. But seriously, we need to get down to the Word of God and learn what God says. If you're being used of God, it means that you're weak. You're, you're, you don't have any power. And you'll be humble before the Lord. And by weakness, I don't mean that you're continuing in your sin. Don't kid yourself that some cannot see the difference. They know when you're living in like a hog and getting up and preaching like an angel. There are people in God's congregation that know that. Did you know that? Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven and some people have a lifeline into heaven. And they know what you're up to. They didn't want to know it. God showed it to them so they'd pray for you and love you in spite of the rotten mess that you're in. But let me let you know that it's known. You're not going to get away from anything in this business, friend. Those who teach will be judged with greater strictness than those who don't. Be careful before you climb up. In these 30 years, I've walked as a pastor and walked with the Lord. I've seen a lot of people come and a lot of people go. I've, you say, I know some rotten preachers. I know more than you do. But Jesus never has failed a single time. And the more I go with the Lord, the more I understand that He works through you and not of you. But let me tell you this. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord and don't kid yourself that people don't know the difference. All the people may not know, but there's always some who know the difference. And they're grieved when they realize there's something funny coming through the pipe. I mentioned before, if there's a good well of water, you turn the tap on, you get water, it's refreshing, it's cool. You drink it, you say, praise the Lord, what a good well of water. But if that water comes out and it's all rusty, you taste it and it tastes bad, has a bitter taste or off, off taste, you say, yuck, something wrong with those old pipes. They'll never be conscious of the pipes, friend, if the water's pure and sweet coming through. The only way that can be possible with dirty vessels like we are is for God to scrub us and clean us. Any day we get to the place we don't need scrubbing and cleaning, friends, we have gone further than, than Paul did. And when somebody tells me they've done that, I want them to see them work the works of Paul. And if they're not doing it, they're lying. They may fool themselves. They won't fool many other people. They might even fool some poor old women. Peter talked about that. Churches, any church that turns into a hen party, it's because there's a bunch of old sick roosters around town. Amen. That's right. I just think it's a shame and a disgrace. Some of these churches you walk in, there are two or three roosters walking around, a whole bunch of little hens. And... That's, not the way it's... That's not the way God organized His work. Some of you are looking at me funny now. You're welcome. Anytime a woman can become the head of the family scripturally and can be the husband of one wife, I believe she ought to be passed in the church. You're welcome. Amen. Amen. Oh, me, it doesn't make any difference to me. Now you know the awful truth. 
that worthy. He doesn't believe in women preachers. That's right. There's a God, there's a glorious ministry for women, but it's not pastor and church. It'll kill them. And you lazy, no good, trifling men that have been called to take that job and let it load off on some woman, shame on you. And may God whip your pants off for doing it. You're supposed to be the cover and protection for that gal so she can prophesy and pray and do other things that God designed her to do, but she didn't, he didn't design her to take that load and break her down. Load of a pastor. That's in the scripture. That's right. And I don't care who says that if Paul was writing the letter today, he'd change it. Lord, have mercy. That's in a new book. I nearly threw up in the floor when I read it. I thought, now that man knows better than that. You can do away with any part of scripture you don't like that way. You. Slave of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ. By the way, he was the half brother of James. He was a brother, a whole brother of James. James was the one that was a pillar of that Jerusalem church. His nickname in secular writings is Old Camel Knees. The camels, you know, get calluses on their knees from kneeling down and getting up. And they say that James had calluses on his knees because he spent so much time on his knees praying. I wonder where our calluses are. We won't explore that. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. There had not been several faiths delivered to the saints. There's only been one. From Genesis to Revelation, it's the same one. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation or judgment, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Look up lasciviousness. If you roll up every nasty, filthy, rotten, hellish thing you can think of and put it in one bundle, that sort of describes lasciviousness. It's not only rotten, filthy things, it's enjoying them. It's like a buzzard does when he gets out here and lights on a dead carcass that's been out there about four or five days in the hot sun. What does he do? He pulls. He, he yanks at it. He likes to stir it. Amen? That's what it's lasciviousness is like. That it not only indulges in wickedness, it enjoys it. It likes to squish it between its toenails. And there are a lot of people like that. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They say, we're free! Let me tell you something. Freedom is not license. I am free to do all things, but I, I am not at liberty to do some things. There are some, there are some scriptures that we must balance out. Avoid the very appearance of evil. I'm not supposed to be handling women other than my wife. You're welcome. I can hug them with a Christian brotherly hug, yes. But I'm not supposed to be fondling around on them. Have any of you noticed that I'm a little careful of the way I handle? Have you noticed the way my men conduct themselves around the ladies? Ladies are ladies. They are to be treated that way. If they need to be touched in some places, you get another lady to do that. Same thing goes for the gals and the boys. We've been going for a long time in this deliverance business. And we've worked to avoid the very appearance of evil. If anybody tells things on us, we want it to be a lie. Can't stop them from telling. You just want them to be sure it's a lie when they tell it. Amen? Then when they do that, we can leap and run and jump for joy. But if it's the truth, then we have to grieve and repent. Amen? Avoid the very appearance of evil. My liberty ends where somebody else's begins. I'm free to do anything, but I'm not free to walk up here and heave a brick through this window. My freedom to throw a brick wherever I want to ends up when it comes through somebody else's window or car. Liberty is not license. As a matter of fact, if you're really free, you are far more responsible. The anarchy that's in the schools, and I taught public schools for ten years, the anarchy that's in the schools has come out of the breakdown of the home. And let me just go ahead and shoot that rabbit while he's running. I'll trace it even further. The home broke down, was not doing what it was supposed to do, and the church rushed in to try to rescue the situation and invented the Sunday school, which is not scriptural. I really hit a sacred cow that time, didn't I? 
You know where children are supposed to be taught? Old and New Testament? In the home. You know why they come to church? To hear the Word of God preached as it is, in purity and power, followed by signs and wonders, to convince them that God's more real than anything on the outside of the building. I believe that. If I hit your sacred cow, excuse me, but you better find your scriptures before you get all bowed up. The, the Sunday school was invented when the church was in a decline, had a hard time. The preachers were busy arguing theological points up in the cloud where nobody was. And evangelism had been lost, and there were some dear people who came up with the idea of Sunday school, and they started evangelizing, and people started getting one to the Lord, and they started having prayer meetings, and revival broke out. Now, God uses a lot of things temporarily and then discards them. Did you know that? You be careful. Just because a movement starts with God doesn't mean God won't destroy it because every movement that God's ever been in since New Testament days has led to a church, a local church. And when it becomes an end in itself, it is destroyed. There are a lot of things that God uses temporarily and as long as they're shoring up and building toward a local church or feeding a local assembly of believers or local assemblies of believers, God will bless it. But the minute it becomes an end in itself, Ichabod comes on it, it's, the glory is departed, and God discards it, and it goes into a spiral. And they, it, I tell you, you just wouldn't believe all the blood transfusions and the respirators and everything else they put on these dying organizations trying to keep them going when God has discarded them because they have moved out of their place. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for the church. And I know the church is the bodies of the believers, but... I also know that He ordained that they should meet in local groups and worship Him. And God's concerned about these little local churches. If you don't believe it, read what He says about people that go in and destroy those little places. He loves the places where God's people meet to pray, to worship Him. However imperfectly they may do it, if they're moving in with God, He'll bless them. Now, these ungodly men turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, and so we have homosexuals in the pulpit being ordained and all this kind of stuff. We have it being slid over lightly. Well, you know, some people are just like that. They sure are. When the homosexual demons come out, they'll be all right. Amen. You're welcome. I've talked to them a lot of times. I've loved a lot of them out of them. You say, oh, I wouldn't touch one of them. Well, see, that's the difference between you and me. God didn't tell you to do it because he knew you wouldn't. My heart breaks when I see a homosexual, and I can tell one as far as I can see him. I'm sorry, but my antenna works. I don't go around judging and condemning people. But my heart just breaks and flows toward people who are in need. And anybody that's trying to hide it, they always get exposed. <laughs> so what do I do? Go up and say, oh, you know what the Lord told me about you? I don't say nothing. I just love them and say, Lord, if you want me to help them, I'll be glad to try You say, try? Well, sure. You didn't think I was perfect, did you? Oh, come on. The only perfect one is Jesus, and he hadn't gotten back yet. If God waited for perfect instruments to do his work, he'd have to wait till Jesus comes back. And that'd be a little late on the scene, wouldn't it? So he's going to work through imperfect instruments. He's going to keep growing us up in the Lord. And he's going to give you on-the-job training if you're willing to work. When a person gets born again in our church, we stick a Bible in one hand and say, grab a leg with the other one and let's go. And they grow up not knowing any different until they get around other church folks. Well, isn't that better? They don't know that Christians are not supposed to love each other until they get outside the hothouse of the church. They hear other people talking about the big fight they had in their church, and they say, fight? In church? That's where we have our love seats. They call, I've had them come and ask me, he said, Pastor, well, I heard they had a big argument, almost had a fist fight over at church. In a church, he said. You know, that was terrible. That's what you do out in the bars, you know. Have fights. I said, well, yes, sometimes that happens. Really? I didn't know that. I'm so glad they didn't know it. Is our church perfect? Oh, my, no. It's so full of flaws. If we could see them all, I expect we'd close down and crawl under the rug and say, Lord, just burn it down on top of us and take us home. But you know, love covers a multitude of sins, and love does flow in our church. If you've seen any of our people around here, you know they love each other. They're crazy. They love each other. And love covers a multitude of sins. And if you love, 
God will do a lot of things. And he'll help grow you out of the errors that you're in and the problems that you got. But you got to love. He said, I want to put you in remembrance that though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. You can lose your physical life over this. It's very serious. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he is reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness to the judgment of the great day. He said, I want to call to your remembrance some things you've overlooked. God is not only a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. Now remember, he starts out, mercy to you and peace and love be multiplied. He said, now you've forgotten some things. There are a lot of things God will put up with, but when people start tampering with his people, when people begin to destroy his work, God can and does move and move swiftly and with destruction and judgment. I wouldn't give you a dime, a cow pen full for a ministry that didn't have a balance between judgment and love. You go out there and disconnect the negative pole off your battery and you'll never crank the car. To have fire, friends, you've got to have both sides, positive and negative. Don't go off positive. Norman Vincent Peale did that and ended up in a mess with mind control. You're welcome. If you've got any of these books, you ought to burn them. I treat them just like Jehovah's Witness literature. Don't tell me I've talked to his spirit so many times in people. It's rotten. It's hellish. It brings soul power. Some of you have been in these sales clinics where they program you so intensively. They use ESP and mind control and soul power in those things, friend. It'll destroy you. All right. He even pitched the angels out who kept not their first estate. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities himself. Now, Sodom, we get our word sodomy, associated with homosexuality. From the word Sodom, Gomorrah, we get our word gonorrhea from. That'll give you an idea what they were doing. Sodom and Gomorrah were going hog wild. They said, anything goes. If it feels good, do it. And God said, it's time to do it. And he did it to them. And when he got through with them, well, boy, they were done. And they're still done. Did you know they're under the Dead Sea right now? Amen. That's right. Nobody's ever lived there since. They gave themselves over to fornication. That's the illicit sexual relationships. And I don't care how sweet you try to make it. Adultery and fornication is rotten, hellish, defiance, and rebellion against God. Never has been sanctified by God. A lot of people say, God told me to divorce my wife and uh, marry somebody else. You're a liar and the truth's not in it. God didn't tell you any such thing. God said the home is to stand. But I can't help it. God made me this way. He didn't make you as rotten as you are. He made you to have self-control, friend. If you ain't got it, you're not fit to stand in the pulpit. You're welcome. And you can tell anybody you know about that's out of control that I said so. I can prove that from the Scriptures. When God puts you in a place, He gives you self-control. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. And you're not fit to minister to the people of God. You bring your body under subjection. Paul did. When did he do it? Every day. <gasps> and he was sanctified. He was the Bible way. Why, Paul got down to the end of his life and said, I haven't yet attained. Don't tell me about what all you've attained. You haven't attained anything. You're not doing as well as Paul did. And he got to the end of his life and said, I'm still at it, still on the road. Let me see your works. You're not producing Paul's work. Uh, Paul's production, don't talk to me about being an apostle. Mm. You're talking about being an apostle, I want to see you do what the apostles did. I'm an old cynic. I'm a skeptic. Well, somebody popped out and told me that. You never heard of anything being mixed up or confused, did you? You better go back and check how many times false prophecies came through by their lying spirits put in the mouths of prophets sometimes. You didn't know that? Boy, you need to study some more. There are times when people with genuine gifts get away from God and the devil feeds them. That's why you ought to pray with people who are gifted. Because if they get carried away with their own importance, they can be deceived. You say, oh, I have a gift from God. Praise the Lord. The gifts are without calling and repentance. You didn't earn it. You couldn't deserve it. However, you better treasure that thing. You're going to be strictly accountable for how that thing's used. You go out of order with it, and God will whack the daylights out of you. You use it for destruction, and God will destroy you. And I don't mean necessarily your life. 
I mean, I, he won't necessarily put you in the grave. There are lots of ways to die, friend. He may expose you before a lot of people you're trying to impress. Amen. For being a sham, a phony, and a fake. And for somebody who's trying to get, get up on top and be popular, that's death. If you don't have any reputation, you have nothing to gain, doesn't make any difference. Hmm? Sodom and Gomorrah. Fornication, going after strange flesh. That's lesbians and homosexuals. Let's put it plain. Set forth in his example, and they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. That's what God thinks about gay liberation. He liberated them into eternal fire. That's, God, that's, what, God's, that's what God thinks of this. There's no way on earth that you can ever justify what God has written, built, judgment over. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Notice they're dreamers, they have dreams. There are valid dreams, revelations from God. But you better check them close. The devil's got his bend full of them too. And if you get to depending on dreams and revelations, the devil will manage to patch a line into your mind. Don't kid yourself, you're not that great. Oh, you say, I discern it, baloney. You'd probably be the first one to be fooled if you're so puffed up and so self-confident, friend. God isn't telling people to do a lot of things they're saying He did. God gets blamed with a lot of stupid stuff. God doesn't tell people to do a lot of fool things. They want to do it, and they get to the place they're so puffed up and so arrogant that they think everything they think is what God says. Amen. Now, folks, that's wrong. And I'm not attacking anybody. I want people to know the truth. And you and I need to realize that we need to walk humbly before our God. What does God require of us? That we walk humbly. That means down low. We have a low opinion of ourselves in that we are not exalting ourselves. And if God, in His grace and mercy, deigns to reach down and touch a lump of clay like us and give us a gift or use us to help somebody else, how it ought to make us humble and cry out to God, Oh, thank you, Lord. It's one, it wasn't wonderful enough that you saved me, but you even used me to pray with that dear woman. And you let me be there when they got saved. Or you let me be there when they got free. And when the authority of your name and your blood set them free. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. You're wonderful. You're better than I ever thought you were. We need to get wrapped up in worship of Him because He would use us. Do you realize that he could do the job better of preaching through angels? They wouldn't make the fool mistakes preachers do. Did you know that? They'd have flawless grammar, absolute contact with the Father. The Holy Spirit would flow through them. Tremendous power. They'd never make a mistake. They'd know exactly what God wants to do because their lines... All fixed up. So what does he do? He uses imperfect lumps of clay to confound the mighty. One of the things the devil the devil hates is when clods of dirt attack him. That's right. You know, when you get to the dirt, you're about as low as you can go, aren't you? And God is rubbing his nose in the dirt. Rubbing the devil's nose in the dirt. I've had them look at me and say, You, where are they? You're dirt, 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 dirt. Praise the Lord. I hadn't thanked Jesus lately because he loved this cloud of dirt. Appreciate you reminding me. Oh, listen, you better thank God because he loves lumps of dirt. And it humbles the mighty princes and brings them low because they have to face clods of dirt who have no authority, who have no power, who have no standing except what's been given to them. They have no authority except the name of Jesus. They have no power except the blood of Jesus. And yet they can successfully attack. It's like a, like a little uh, big old grizzly bear walking along out here, and uh, a little black ant stands up and shakes his fist and says, Get back! That old bear goes, Aah! You better get out of my way, and I'm going to squash you. Get back! It's worse than that when we tie into a demon. Did you know that? Those rascals are big. You didn't know that, did you? They are monsters. But they have to flee. They're not bigger than Jesus. Please turn the tape over. Thank you. And there's nothing that will cause you to magnify the Lord more than to see the enemy flee. Amen. 
before the name of your God. You want people to worship God? You want them to get into the Word? I would advise deliverance. I mean a deliverance ministry like the church is supposed to have. You integrate it in your regular services. You take care of whatever is necessary. If deliverance is necessary, do that. If healing is necessary, do that. If salvation is necessary, take care of that. If counseling is necessary, do that. Should you, I mean, it should be a general thing all the time. You know what will happen? People will begin to read their Bibles. We've never had a read your Bible campaign in our church yet. And yet our people are reading like crazy in the Word of God. I never saw anything like it. I didn't do it. God put them in the Word. When they get on their knees helping people, and they begin to realize the enemy is real, they begin to search the Scriptures. I preach to them, try to give them enough of the Word to tantalize their appetite. That's all any preacher can do. He can't feed you. You'll starve to death. That's all you get. Amen. But if you can get the people started to reading for themselves, then they can come and get a booster shot at church. That's right. It'll, it'll, it'll promote Bible study. It'll promote prayer. It'll promote holy living. It'll promote witnessing. It just does the whole shooting match. And it's not because deliverance is so great. It's just because you're doing what everything God wants. Salvation, healing, deliverance. You've got a full gospel, a real full gospel church. And it'll do. It'll go. It's a going Jesse. Several times people have visited the church and they... Our church is over half young people, by the way. They'll come in. You saw a bunch of them with me. There's more than that back there that wanted to come. Oh, listen, several times somebody's come up to my wife and said, I just think it's marvelous how Pastor Willie's trained all these young people. I never saw such a bunch of people. They just go in, they know what to do, they just go right ahead. All he does is just say this and this and this and there they go. I walk around and rest most of the time. They made me lazy. But seriously, she told him, she said, he didn't do anything. He taught them the Word of God, got them baptized in the Holy Spirit, got them saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has done what you see happening. Amen. Now, friend, I merely mention that to say He'll do that anywhere. But, of course, you have to have somebody who could care less about reputation, who could care less about what people think or what people say, who's more concerned about the Word of God than he is of what people think. I'm not bragging on myself. I mean, after 30 years, I ought to have that much sense, ought I? I mean, 30 years in the, in the way. I'm older than that, considerably. I'm old enough to be your daddy, most of you. Well, not some of you gals and boys out there. In our church, though, we don't have any old folks. We have the young people and the more mature ones. I fall in the latter category. All right. Likewise, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now, these people are characterized by rebellion. They despise dominion. They will not accept authority. They're totally rebellious. They never come under authority to anybody. They're a law unto themselves. And this is a dead giveaway that they're out of order and God will not use them. I don't care how much fuss they make, how much splash they make in the water, they're not going to be used of God. Samson is an example of them. The Spirit came on him. He did mighty feats. But when you think of Samson, what do you think about? Getting a haircut in the devil's barbershop. Mm -hmm. You remember he ended up blinded, bound, and grinding at the devil's mill. And that's what will happen to every one of these birds. He performed many spectacular exploits, but not he didn't do one thing that lasted. Not one. Find it. Samson did spectacular exploits, but not a thing he did lasted. And Jesus talks about bearing fruit that remains and produces more fruit. By the way, the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. The order in Genesis is each produces after its own kind. Amen. So a rotten tree is going to produce more rotten trees. An adulterous preacher will produce others who will be adulterous, adulterers and adulteresses. That's the way it goes. A proud, pharisaical leader will produce that kind of people. And they'll turn on him too. And a lot of preachers couldn't pastor a church if their life depended on it. 
That's why they're out canvassing the country. You're welcome. A pastor has to live with his mistakes. And I, I've never, I, I don't, I hardly ever use men in my church to minister who are not pastors because the, the other guys will hurt you. They don't mean to, but they do. Because they think the way to, to do things is to come in and tear everything to pieces. And then they leave you with the mess to fix. A pastor loves the people. He'll give himself for the sheep, and he'll take the lick rather than to give it. And he'll bless and strengthen your people. And yet he's got sense enough to be hard as nails where it's right, but he'll be soft and tender toward those who are trying to find the way. A lot of men who can't be pastors, there's only one reason, they can't get along with anybody. And that's not an attribute of a man of God, friend. Check me out in the Bible. I'm not, I'm not afraid of you checking the Bible. I know what it says. I've been studying it for over 30 years. This isn't new to me. And the attributes of the man of God, you come to place when you have to live in one place with the same bunch of people. And you think, you're, some of you are checking it out. You're thinking, yeah, you know, I remember so-and-so came through. He tore that church up. My land wasn't that a mess. He stayed three months, and then we had the biggest mess. And that church never did get back together. Mm-hmm. And contention and strife is of the devil, it's not the Lord. Sure, there's going to be division when the Word of God's preached, but the sheep are going to come out, and they're going to gravitate toward the Word of God. Well, he goes on, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. These fellows tie into everything without even knowing what they're tackling. They may laugh at the dignitaries of the angels. You better be careful. You better be under the cover. You can do that when you're under the blood. And when you're confident that you're not resting on yourself but up on him. Because he has authority. And you have all the authority he has. Did you know believers do that? Does he have authority over angels? Does he? In Christ I also have. One of the most uh, withering things you can do to a demon who's being defiant is to remind him, I am seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. I've had him tell me over and over again, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I said, but you're going to hear it anyway. I'm high above Satan, high above dominions, powers, principalities. Not in myself, but in my Savior. I'm clothed in him. And there's nothing you can do. I've had him look at me and say, I'd like to rip your face to shreds. I said, why don't you try? I said, shut your mouth. You know those angels are standing there. I said, how about that? You said, does it always work? No, I don't always take that much chance. Don't kid yourself. No matter how close you walk into God, remember the stones that hit Stephen. They killed him too. Don't get the idea you're immortal because you're in the will of God. They chopped Paul's head off. They crucified Peter. Why didn't he just say, oh, I'm in the will of God. There's nothing you can do. Even our pattern, Jesus, he came to the end of the line, laid his life down. You and I may be called on to seal our testimony with our blood. That's all right, isn't it? What's so bad about that? We must get down to these next verses. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. You want to tear up their nest? Did you ever see a battering ram knock down a door? It does it by just banging the same old thing. Bang, right in the same spot. Bang. You only, you only give you a battering ram when you're working in deliverance? The Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you, Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you, Satan. About the tenth time, that demon will get restless. He'll start acting up. I've had him say, shut up! I said, not yet. The Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you, Satan. Hit him again. Oh, listen. My Lord has power, all power, and in him I can be clothed in his power. Now he says, these, these speak evil of the things they know not. Boy, that's right. You hear a lot of dumb things said about demons. Since, I, since we've been working these years in deliverance, I've never heard so much ignorance paraded as, as knowledge in my life. No such thing, not this. And I think, why don't you read the scriptures? Why don't you quit building on religious fantasy and theorizing and go down to facts and see what it really says, not what you think it says? They speak evil of the things they know not. What they know naturally is brute beast, and those things they corrupt themselves. This is the key. 
They are corrupt people. They lie. They're double-minded. They're immoral. And let me, let me mention this to you. You watch this. If a preacher gets way off doctrinally, if he goes off on a tangent doctrinally, away from the Word of God, he will soon be off morally. If he goes off morally, he'll soon be off doctrinally. They go together. So be careful. That's why you don't want a homosexual ministering to you. That's why you don't want an adulterous man ministering to you. Because there's error. And sooner or later it's going to swing off. You need people who've been saved and set free from that stuff. Lust you'll always have to uh, contend with. But I'm talking about the people who go ahead who play with this thing. It's written all over them. It's in their eyes. Watch people's eyes. That's where you'll see the demons work. When they're under deep oppression and they're driven of the devil, their eyes will be dark. That's the only way I know how to put it. Their eyes are dark. There's no life there. The deeper the oppression, the darker their eyes are. They just, they just have no luster to them. Watch people's eyes. That's, what, that's, that's the place they cannot... They, now, they can, they can smile. They can jump around. They can preach. They can sing. They can do anything. But they can't hide what's in their eyes. Mm -hmm. You can look right inside them. I've had people come and tell me, by the way, when I first saw you, I thought you had the meanest eyes in the world. I said, well, what do you think now? They just got through getting delivered. I said, I just think you're the sweetest thing. I just want to hug your neck. I said, well, how strange. You know, it's, it's nice when people react violently one way or the other to you, isn't it? Then they say, I hate you when we're there. I said, well, I never met one of your bunch I liked either. You know, I mean, I know you're sitting around swapping compliments. I don't care for their bunch either, do you? I don't want any of them in me, and I don't want them in anybody else. Verse 11. Woe to them. They've gone into the way of Cain. Now, Cain is the way of false religion and works religion. Go back with me to Genesis and look at the picture. Cain and Abel, the sacrifice had been made by God in the beginning, clothed men and women with clothes, and the devil's been trying to take them off of them ever since. I don't know how long the coats of skin were. I wouldn't argue with you, but I'm sure they were modest since God urges modesty. And you can see immodesty, by the way, and harlotry in people by the way they dress. It's very obvious. It comes out. Now, I don't... Uh, you say, well, I guess you don't believe women ought to do this, that, and other. Well, no, I think the old barn needs most paint generally gets a touch-up now and then. Some of them might do better with something, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not shooting at anybody. I'm not trying to make fun of it. You wear makeup or don't wear it, whichever you like. I've always thought it was a little ridiculous, though, to make a big to-do about lipstick and wear powder. And as a Baptist preacher, I used to sniff around a lot of Pentecostal meetings because I was hunting to see what they had. I told you, they turned me off. I would have come into a lot of this a long time ago if they hadn't been so anti-scriptural in some of the things they were doing. I never did act ugly. I was a visitor, and I behaved myself, and I never criticized them or anything else. But I sat and listened, and I looked, and I watched my Bible. But I just noticed this. I noticed that while they came down hard on powder, I mean on, excuse me, lipstick, you couldn't fix your eyes, and your hair had to be just so, or it had to be the beehive, you know, the big bushel basket kind that was popular for a while. Uh, but the powder, I couldn't, I couldn't see the difference. You buy it in the same cosmetic store. I heard J. Harold Smith one time. You ought to be familiar with him, the old Baptist over here. I guess he's still at Fort Smith, maybe. I heard him one time preaching, and he said, you know, he was at a meeting, and he preached something, and I guess this lady didn't like it too much, and she came up, and she was very severely dressed. She had, you know, high neck, black dress, long, so you know the type I'm talking about. Very holy. And she came up to him, and, and she, she came up to him, and she shook hands with him, and he said, I could tell she didn't like what I said. She said, I see you wear perfume. He said, I see you don't. <laughs> now see, there's a, there, there should be a line somewhere. 
God's people ought not to attract attention by smelling bad. But on the other hand, they ought not to be so far over the other way. Did you know we're not supposed to attract attention to ourselves by over our underdressing? And so you don't want to uh, go to a monk's robe or something like that, so you, they'll say, oh, look how pious, you know, or how stupid, depending on who's looking at you. But on the other hand, we ought to hit somewhere in the middle of the road where we can keep God's standards of modesty, which were mentioned here the other day, and yet we don't swing to the other extreme and get off the track. Cain offered the works of his hands to the Father. The pattern was set. Adam had taught both boys, Cain and Abel. So Abel came and brought the blood sacrifice. The blood means the life of the flesh is in the blood, but it's pouring out of that blood is symbolic of death. It admits, I am a sinner worthy of death. The death has passed on this innocent animal. Therefore, it is now taken away by substitution. Looking forward to the great substitute that was coming. Now, Cain comes up, and he had the first do-it-yourself religion kit. He made it up himself. He thought. He didn't know how the devil had put this in his mind gave him a revelation. You don't have to go that route. This is, that's old stuff. That's traditional. Throw it out. Now, what you really need to do is offer God all these beautiful first fruits out of your garden. I don't think he brought the nubbins. I think he brought the very best. I've never seen false religionists that didn't bring the very best. Boy, I mean, they'll pour money in. They'll bring the best. Their buildings are beautiful. They'd never have a building look like this. It'd be more like a cathedral. They had to sell their houses to build it. They'd do it. Hmm? False religionists, the do-it-yourself kit, they always bleed you white for money. Armstrong, that hellish mess, mixture of Judaism, Hebrew, uh, Seventh-day Adventism, got a smear of this and a smear of that, and got just a little tiny smish of Bible in it. Just enough to fool the unwary. Now, false religion, the do-it-yourself people have been around a long time. Mary Baker Eddy. She wrote Science and Health and Key to the Scriptures. It's too bad she didn't read the Scriptures before she wrote the Key. Of course, if you're going to listen to demons, you don't need that. She didn't discover anything new. She wrote the same thing that First John has written to destroy, the old Gnostic heresy. It's been around a long time. It's been kicking around a long time. But she revived it and put it in new dress. Christian science, you know, is grape nuts. Grape nuts is neither grapes nor nuts. Christian science is neither Christian nor scientific. It's just demonic. It's an occult religion just like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. All of them run under witchcraft. There are a lot of places that run under witchcraft under the Christian name, too. We ran across terminal illnesses in a person that had been put on them in a full gospel church by a woman who was deluded into thinking she had a gift of healing. She laid hands on this woman, and these vicious spirits came in, about six of them. You better be careful who lays hands on you. Be sure they're tuned up with God. Not that they say they are, but be sure the fruit's there. Fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. If those are missing, throw them out. Throw them out. I don't care what else they got. They ain't got it. Love, joy, peace. There's, there's the key to the, whether the ministries of the Lord or not. Fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. You wouldn't think you'd find it over in Galatians, but that's your, that's your measuring stick. If that's not there, there's something bad wrong. Now, Cain offered his own offering, and God wouldn't accept it. Now, we don't know how the acceptance came. Maybe fire fell from heaven. The Bible doesn't say. It'd only be idle speculation to say what had happened. At any rate, in some way, Cain and Abel both knew that Abel's was accepted, Cain's was rejected. Now, what does rotten religion always do? The minute it's put alongside the real thing, God obviously accepts the truth that he has laid out, and he rejects the error. The blessing is on one and is not on the other. So what happens? Rotten religion inevitably reacts with an attack on the truth. Now, since you don't want to take God on, that's pretty good order. So you attack the one whose offering was accepted. And that's what he did. Cain went off, nom, 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 nom. What did God do that for? And you know, God was so merciful, he went to Cain. He said, Cain, why are you grumbling? Why are you complaining? You know what to do. Why don't you do it? 
I don't want to do it that way anymore. This other's better. I figured it out. There's something wrong with Abel. And the Bible said he rose up and slew his brother Abel. Now, the word for slew or killed in the Hebrew is interesting because it tells us how Cain killed Abel. He ripped his jugular vein out with his hands. You wondered why there was so much blood on the ground? The word for slew is the same word used for a wolf who rips out the throat of a sheep. And I believe he ripped his jugular vein. He was so furious. He ripped that jugular vein out and the blood gushed out on the earth and he pulled bushes over and hid him, hid the body and walked on down the road. And God comes along and said, Cain, where's Abel? Was God asking for information? You know, a lot of times when God asks you something, He's not asking for information. He wants to give you some. When he said, Adam, where art thou? He wasn't asking for information. He already knew where Adam was. Cain, where's your brother? He was going to bring him face to face with his sin. So what does Cain do? What every sinner does? I don't know. What you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about, God. He said, oh, you should have taken the last train out. The last chance to repent. Listen, when God calls you, you better answer with repentance when it's needed because you never know when it's the last call. With Abel, the last call was, where is your brother? He should have said, oh God, I've done a horrible thing. I have killed my brother. Could you ever forgive me for this? But he said, I don't know. Go to the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel. Samuel had been up all night long weeping. He'd walked following Saul. He walks up into the camp. Saul said, oh, good grief, get those cows and sheep out of sight. Get them over that hill. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I didn't know he was going to trail us here. That old man, he's, ooh. I could explain it away to everybody else, but ooh. You know, Samuel, he's so straight-laced. Ooh. Uh, oh, greetings, uh, Samuel. Brother Samuel, I'm, I just was hoping you'd come. Liar. And he was so nervous about what he had done that the first thing he did was lie. He said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel looked at him and he said, Would you shut up? And I'll tell you what God has said to me this night. He did that right after, you know, Samuel said, I performed the commandment of the Lord. And old cow went, Boo. The sheep went, Boo. Samuel said, If you've done what God said, what's this I hear? Anytime you think you can flim-flam God, He'll nudge an old covered sin and make it blare out on you. You're not dealing with somebody you can get around it with. You can't get around it, over it, or under it. You've got to go through. God was facing Saul with his sin, so what did He do? He blamed it on the people. The people wanted this. And yet the Scripture plainly says Saul and the people decided to do it. They'd have never done it if God's anointed man had said, that's not right, folks. We've got to do it God's way. They did everything he told them to. But when the, when the prophet cornered him, he said, I have, uh, it was the people. And when Samuel got through blessing him out, he blistered him up from, from, uh, Dan to Beersheba. He ripped his hide off. He chewed him up. He spit him out and said, God has discarded you, big boy. You're still on the throne. You're still the king, but you're dead. Saul was never worth killing after that. He went crazy because God with truth from him. His was the sin of presumption. He presumed he could do as he pleased and change God's Word to suit himself. That's dangerous business. And Saul was judged for it. Cain was judged for it. Cain was told by God, you love to stay at home. You love, you're a dirt farmer. You love the dirt. You love to grow things. Got news for you, big boy. You'll never settle anymore. You're going to wander on the face of the earth and you'll never settle down anywhere anymore. Not only that, I'm marking you and every animal and every human being that sees you will know. And they'll run from you and be scared of you. And Cain screamed out, my punishment is greater than I can bear. But he had to bear it anyway. He didn't get to die and get out of it. Listen, friend, you cross God up. Don't you count on dying and getting out. Mm-mm. You're going to live with that mess. You're going to weep many bitter tears for it. It's not worth it. You say, well, ooh, that's such a black picture. Let me give you a good one now. Another man sitting on the throne. Hadn't prayed, hadn't talked to God for about a year. He'd gone to church, gone through the ceremonies. One day a prophet named Nathan walked in. 
told him a story. David said, oh, boy, I was worried when you showed up. I'm glad that's all it is. Oh, I'll fix it. And oh, boy, he went into this big deal. And when he got through, Nathan said, Thou art the man you've just pronounced your own sentence. Now, had David done like Saul or like Cain and tried to avoid the issue, tried to say it's not so, the Bible is clear he would have dropped dead on the spot. But he, being a man after God's own heart, immediately crumpled and said, I have sinned. Nathan said, good thing you said that. Death will pass on the baby and not you. 51st Psalm tells of David's experience here. What a blessed thing it is how God will give us opportunity right up to the last minute to turn. But there comes a time when the judgment falls. And you needn't go out and sow a crop of wild oats and run down to church and pray for a crop failure either. That won't work either. I guarantee you the best place to be, though, if you've got to have a whipping, is in the lap of God. When I was a boy growing up, my dad had a razor strap behind the bathroom door that sharpened more than razors. It sharpened my understanding of right and wrong. And uh, he believed literally that the child should be uh, corrected the Bible way. And when I was little, you know, I felt like he'd grab me by the arm and he'd whop me with that strap where I needed it. Wasn't any bones to break down there. Broke my heart. But uh, anyway, I, I was foolish when I was younger. You know, I thought the further I could get away from him, the better I was. I didn't realize that, that gave leverage, you know. You kids, uh, listen to me now. I'm going to mess you parents up. The next time you have to get a spanking, don't run from mom or daddy. Run to them and hug their neck. Then, you know, it, it, it's hard to get a good lick. You think those kids not listening? You wait till the next time around. I've had parents come up to me and said, you like to ruin our household. <laughs> said, I nearly died last time I had to spank my kid. They come up there just crying, hugging my neck, tell me they were sorry. That's the best place to be if you've got to have a spanking friend. Get on God's lap. That's what David did. He said, I'm going to sit on God's lap. Go ahead, Lord. Do whatever you like. I don't want anybody charging you. That's what he said in the fifth verse Psalm. Don't charge God. I, whatever he does, it's all right. I accept it before I know what it's going to be. The era of Cain was a new religion, a bloodless religion, a religion of works. I'm offering what I can do, my hands. They ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. Remember Balaam, the talking donkey? That man, was so he was so in love with money that it didn't even startle him when that donkey talked to him. I mean, if I was walking down this road out here and I came by and there's an old mule standing out there, and he said, hello there, Whirly. Well, I'm not given to fear or anything, but I'd probably want to talk to him from across the road somewhere, and, you know, where I could see him better. I mean, you, you'd, you'd have a tendency to get away from that monster that was doing what he wasn't supposed to do. But this... This false, well, he wasn't a false prophet. He was a true prophet. He had a prophet. He was trying to give a false prophecy, and God blocked him, choked him to death like this. And God had to talk to him through a donkey. So if God talks to somebody through you, don't be flattered. He used a donkey. Maybe he just thought, well, who's available? There's a donkey. Take you or me. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? He used the rooster crowing to, to convict Peter. If he can do that, he can use you and me. The heir of Balaam. These preachers with cash registers, watch out. Greedy of filthy lucre disqualifies a man to be a leader in God's work. Did you know that? You know why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Nothing wrong with money. It's the love of it. And he doesn't have to have much of it to love it. Some people love $10 better than some people love 1000 Job was the richest man on earth when he lived. Abraham was too. Their riches never got between them and God. They worshiped God. They praised God. They served God. It never did bother them. So riches is not the uh, problem. It's not what you do with riches. 
a million, if which it should be a lot, but it's what you're doing at present with a dollar and a quarter you've got. A lot of people live on air, you know, air castles. Oh, if I had this, I'd do that. If I had this, I'd do the other. And they wouldn't do anything. Because they're not doing anything with what they're doing except robbing God with what they've already got. What made you, didn't you ever read that Jesus said the one who's faithful in little things will be given much? So what happens? People want to stop, start on top shelf. But when I get my million, then boy, I'll tell you, we'll build that campground, praise the Lord, we'll do this. But they wouldn't give you $10 or $20 to get it going now. <clears throat> That's just lying. That's living in a fantasy world. Balaam was greedy for material things. He wanted clothes. He wanted position. He wanted money. He wanted people to think he was great. And he was willing to sell the people of God to do it. That's the deadly thing. He actually was. And when that scallywag was blocked by God again and again, he finally turned and said, I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how to do it. Get them to worship idols and God will get them. And friend, there's a lot of people teaching idol worship and they're not in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, dear friends, would you just send ten dollars to keep this good old gospel hour on the radio? It lasts fifteen minutes. That's a lie. First thing, gospel hour. That always hacks me somehow or another. Amen. Now, friend, if you'll send in ten dollars, I'll send you surprise package one thousand four hundred and fifty-nine. If you'll send fifteen dollars, I'll send you a super package. He talks about this for about twelve of the fifteen minutes. At the end, he said, now, he'll quote John 3.16. Now, dear friends, I hope you'll come to my rescue because I'll tell you we've got to keep this good old gospel going out. I say, Lord, dry it up. Don't let anybody send him a dollar. I hope he's telling the truth and he's about to go off the air. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Thank God. He's not preaching the gospel. He's milking the people. He's a religious racketeer. And I really get my dander up about religious racketeers. Go around fleeing fleece God's people. Don't you be a dummy and just say, just because somebody said, praise the Lord, they're of the, of the Lord. They're not. The devil's got a bunch of, of deadbeats and sloths and, and lazy ones running around here. They're not willing to do anything. They couldn't get along with any church. They tore up every church they went into, and then they got on one of these little old stations and they started drumming it up, and some uh, the old saint said, well, he sounds so good, bless his heart. Here he is living with somebody else's wife and all this kind of stuff. You better find out who you're supporting, friend. There's some good radio preachers. There's some good television preachers. But don't you go hog wild. You find out what they're doing. All that glitters is not gold, and all that quotes the Bible is not right. Find out what they're really doing. Some of those birds are the biggest fakes and phonies in the world. I'm telling you for sure. I know what I'm talking about. You'd be far better putting your money in a local assembly where you know what's going on. Put missionaries you know to be God's men and women. Take a little time to investigate. There's nobody who's genuine who objects to being investigated. Amen. The only ones that get ruffled are the ones who got something to hide. They're afraid you find out. If they're afraid you find out, drop them. Don't even bother to go through with it. They're not worth it. they got something to hide. Don't worry about it. They're not the right ones. Well, perish in the gainsaying of Korah. <laughs> That's in the Old Testament, too. Gainsaying means defiance and rebellion against the Word of God. Against God's order. Moses was instructed by God. You'd think he had the credentials to be the leader, wouldn't you? I've always wondered where Korah was when God, Moses was out there in the desert getting the burning, around the burning bush. But you get something going, and there's always somebody going to come along and tell you what to do with it and what not to do. Harmony, you and Glenn, remember that. Ask them where they were when you were at the burning bush. And they were back in Egypt playing footsie with the Pharaoh. Uh, Korah and his bunch came along, and they got in a big uproar because God told Moses, you Saron and his sons aside, they're going to be the high priestly tribe. Korah said, well, I wish you'd look at that, putting his family in. And he got a couple of other guys with him, and they got, the, they got a committee of three. And they said, our sons are just as fine as Aaron's. Where does he get off having Aaron be the high priest? Where did he get off doing it? It was God's orders. Don't you set aside God's orders on anything for marriage or anything else. You try to find out what God says and do it. 
That's what our job is, not to try to make up new things for God. Well, they came and they had quite a little hubbub going. And all there was a big stir going, and these three families were ahead of it. Moses went to God and said, Lord, what are you going to do? What, what do we do now? He said, you tell everybody to get away from those folks and their tents. Moses said, everybody get back away from those tents. Here goes the people backing off. You can see all the people coming out, looking out of the tents, you know. And all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. The earth begins to shake. She opens up. Flames shoot out. And down they go, screaming into the fires. Well, now that sort of settled the dust. I mean, that settled the question who was going to be the high priestly family. God took out the uh, opposition. You say, well, he doesn't always do that. Well, he might. What he's done once, he could do again if he took the notion to. If I were you, I wouldn't challenge God's order. I'd find out and be sure it's God's order and stay with it. Gainsaying means to deliberately override what God says. God has a chain of command, a chain of authority. If you'll follow that, you'll find out it'll work. It'll work in homes. It'll work in churches. It'll work in camps. Irma and Glenn are in charge of this camp. When I came here, I came here to do whatever they asked me to do, the best I could. If I get to where I can't do what they ask, I'll just say, praise the Lord, I believe I better go. They're the authority here. Don't you go bucking and pitching around. If you've got suggestions, they'll hear them. But don't you, they're the authority here. Did you know that? Your preacher is the authority back in your church. If he's wrong, if you go to God and tell God about it, he'll straighten him out. Or put him out. That's the way to handle it, friends. Well, I've gone too long. I'm going to stop. Run Glenn's tape all up. Praise the Lord. But we need teachers like that, don't we? Amen. I don't know how solemn and odd you are, but I am. I'm afraid to do my own thing. In you, right now, that does not like what you've just heard, then it's a foreign alien. It's a Jebusite. It's a parasite. It's something that is not the Holy Ghost. If there's anything in there that doesn't like me, if there's anything in there that doesn't like Brother Worthy, if there's any feeling in you right now that does not like what you heard when I read the book of Joel, that's an alien because that was the Word of God. Now, don't lie to yourself. Don't try to lie to us. Don't lie, try to lie to God or to the Holy Ghost. Ananias and Sapphira tried it, didn't they? If you don't know that story, look in the Bible. It might scare you. No wonder we get heart attacks. If we try to lie to the Holy Ghost. This is the end of the CD.